Look at this 1937 D28. Gorgeous Brazilian rosewood back and sides. It has a two-piece back on it. Now look at this 1956 D21. Again, gorgeous Brazilian rosewood back and sides, and again, you see this two-piece back that's on it. Now look at this 1965 D35. Notice anything different? It's still gorgeous Brazilian rosewood back and sides, but the difference isn't hard to see. This D35 model has a three-piece back. And sure, this might seem like an insignificant detail, but for me it begs the question, why would Martin seemingly all of the sudden, after literally 132 years of guitar building, decide to start making a guitar with a three-piece back? For purists at the time, uh, the two-piece back had been, and really still is, the gold standard of a properly constructed dreadnought. But for some reason, there was Martin, churning out a new model, a three-piece back guitar, and not only that, they assigned this new guitar a model number higher than their flagship guitar. Uh, this is not a 28, it is a 35. The answer to why a three-piece back and why it appeared so suddenly stems to an embargo that was newly enacted by Brazil and just beginning to take shape in the mid-1960s. If the term embargo just gave you a mental image of this political cartoon, then congratulations, you probably paid attention in your United States history class. But for anybody who is unfamiliar with the term, an embargo is whenever one country decides to restrict trade with another country or countries, plural. Uh, and this typically happens because the country who has imposed the embargo is attempting to protect an economic asset of some kind. In this case, the asset is Brazilian rosewood, or more accurately, I guess, the asset that's getting protected here technically is going to be the milling industry associated with processing this highly desirable Brazilian rosewood. And the country enacting it, of course, is Brazil. To give a slightly wider context here, any business who dealt in wood manufacturing wanted Brazilian rosewood, not just guitar makers. I mean, this stuff looks amazing. Just look at any of the countless examples of highly figured Brazilian rosewood grain, and it's not hard to see why everyone wanted this stuff. But most manufacturers who used Brazilian rosewood imported whole timber, or like full logs, from Brazil, and then would process it themselves. Imagine those trucks that you see going down the road with like giant pine tree logs in them. Uh, whole product like that, but Brazilian rosewood. And then it would get consumed by international manufacturers to make a table here or a 1964 D28 there, and that seemed to work really well for a while. But in 1965, Brazil essentially says, okay, that's it. No more unmilled wood. You want our highly desirable wood? Well, we want to protect our milling industry, so no more full logs or full timber for you. You want this highly figured tone wood Martin guitars? Well, then we're going to be the ones milling it for you, then you can buy it from us, already pre-cut, essentially. I have no idea what kind of effect this had on furniture makers, but for guitar makers like Martin, they weren't exactly thrilled at the prospect of having to relinquish any measure of their tone wood's integrity to some sort of an outside milling process. So that, coupled with the fact that Martin did have genuine concerns over the quality of this milled wood, uh, some of which they did purchase after the embargo, uh, makes it easy to see how Martin is going to have to start thinking outside of the box and try to come up with some sort of a solution to their uh, supply problem here. Questions like, how much bulk product do we already have in our possession that we've imported prior to the embargo? Uh, and things like, how can we make our product last as long as possible before having to completely shift to a plan B. Then comes along this guy named Bob Johnson. Not to be confused with Robert Johnson, but Bob Johnson. This isn't actually a picture of Bob Johnson. I couldn't find a picture of Bob Johnson whenever I Google search, or at least not somebody that I think was actually the Bob Johnson associated with Martin guitars in the mid-1960s. Apparently, Bob Johnson was a computer guy that was somehow associated with the Martin Guitar Company or just friends of individuals in the Martin Guitar Company. But his importance here is that whenever he learned of Martin's Brazilian Rosewood quandary, he was the guy that said, hey, 
why don't you guys make a guitar with a three-piece back to it? Uh, now this wasn't a long-term solution to the Brazilian Rosewood issue for Martin, but it was a solution that lets Martin use as much of their existing Brazilian stock as possible. Um, just think about it. So you've just milled a two-piece back out of a chunk of rosewood for a D28. What do you do with those scrap pieces that are inevitably left over? Well, depending on the size of the leftovers, it's completely possible to repurpose them into a three-piece back guitar. So just imagine how much unusable Brazilian rosewood existed at the Martin Guitar Factory that all of the sudden becomes usable again in the idea of just put it into a three-piece back. Uh, this piece that was too small for a match D28 or D21, put it into a D35. Like just chunk it in a pile and we'll start building them. But here's the real genius of this. The D28 sold for $375 brand new in 1965. For anybody that's curious, whenever we adjust that number for inflation, it comes out to $3,072.80 in the purchasing power of today's US dollar. But the crazy thing is, this new D35, which kind of is scrap wood, uh, it's what it's being built out of, it sold for $50 more. It sold for $425, as opposed to the flagship D28 that was selling for $375. That new D35 at $425 comes to, in today's terms, $3,482.50. So they're selling it for significantly more money. So now we have a new model of the guitar that's made with a three-piece back uh, this helps to alleviate some of the rosewood supply problem for Martin guitars. But what's more is that this new design actually sounds great. It's not like the 35 is some lesser instrument in any way. Martin stumbles upon something that defined a generation of folk singers and songwriters uh, and still endures to this day. The three-piece back gives a fullness of sound that was ideal for the one-man show. Uh, the 35 was even being played by big names like Johnny Cash, Jim Croce, and Elvis Presley. By the late 1960s, Brazilian rosewood was becoming less and less accessible and less and less feasible as the chief component of a guitar's construction. By 1970, Martin was manufacturing almost exclusively with East Indian rosewood. Um, there are rumors, I say rumors, there's evidence that there was still like some guitars that kind of uh, got through the mold after 1970 that still had uh, some Brazilian rosewood components to them, but by and large, by 1970, Martin shifted uh, out of necessity to using East Indian rosewood. That original rationale behind why the 35 was needed in the first place, that uh, the fact that it made manufacturing sense, that was gone, but thankfully the 35 stayed with them. That accident guitar of 1965, the D35 model, has found and has kept its place as a respected component of the Martin guitar line. It's still highly regarded for its distinct sound and is considered to be a working horse guitar for musicians around the world. And all that said, I think it's probably my favorite model Martin guitar.